Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Nightlight. A reminder that you are never alone. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Nightlight. I want to thank Ken Quiethawk for his amazing intro. Please check him out on the Internet. He and his wife are Native American storytellers and The work that they have done to preserve their history and their tradition is phenomenal and not to be denied. You all know that I read a lot of books for this show. I I read every book we talk about, sometimes twice, sometimes even more than that. Um, And I recommend all of the books or I wouldn't actually have them on the show. Uh, tonight's, Tonight's author and tonight's book is special unique. Uh, I not only highly recommend it, if I could insist on it, I would. It's, It's a book that has magic in the words and a truth that cannot be denied. Uh, it's, it's a phenomenal book on a topic that everybody ha- has heard about, but it's probably faded from memory, and it's really, it's time that we brought this memory back into our present and became more aware of it because it's important or we'll make a big mistake sometime down the road that that cannot be changed at all. I have Dr. Charlie Pellegrino on the show tonight and drawing on the voices of atomic bomb survivors and the new science of forensic archaeology, Charles, Charles Pellegrino describes the events and the aftermath of two days in August when the nuclear devices were detonated over Japan that changed life on Earth forever. To Helen Back offers a stunning You Are There time capsule wrapped in elegant prose, and it is elegant. His scientific authority and close relationship with the A-bomb survivors make his account the most gripping and authoritative ever written. At the narrative's core are eyewitness accounts of those who experienced the atomic explosions firsthand, the Japanese civilians on the ground as the first city targeted Hiroshima is the focus of most histories. Charlie gives equal weight to the bombing of Nagasaki um, symbolized by the 30 people who are known to have fled Hiroshima for Nagasaki where they arrived just in time to survive the second bomb. One of them, a Mr. Yamasaki, is the only person who experienced the full effects of both cataclysms within ground zero. The second time, the blast effects were diverted around the stair- by a stairwell behind which his office conference was convened, placing him and few others in a shock cocoon that offered protection while the entire building disappeared around them. Dr. Pellegrino weaves spellbinding stories together with an illustrated narrative that challenges the official report showing exactly what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and why. 
He is the author of 12 books, including Unearthing Atlantis and Her Name, Titanic. He's a paleo... <laughs> oh, I'm going to mess it up. A paleontologist who designs robot spare probes and relative rockets and in his science oh and is the scientist whose dinosaur's cloning recipe inspired Michael Crittenden's best-selling novel Jurassic Park in his spare time Dr. Pellegrino writes acclaimed science fiction novels and mind-bending techno chillers uh, the director of Speed and Twister has been signed on to direct the film version of his book, Biological Disaster, uh, named Dust. And he is the recipient of the 2000 Isaac Osma Maz Memorial Award for Science Writing. He's extraordinarily talented. Um, he has taken and presented this material in a way that is so compelling, you're not superficially reading about something. You are absolutely involved in it. You, you become personally involved with the people that he speaks of and the people who are speaking and relating their stories. It's a matter of coming from observation to being a participant with them, and it is a stunningly, amazingly written book. So I encourage all of you to pick up a copy of To Hell and Back, The Last Train from Hiroshima. And I want to welcome to the show Charlie Pellegrino. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here tonight. Thank you. I, I, your, book, your book absolutely um, was the kind that I, I mean, I read a lot. I could not put it down. I sat up two full nights. I read two full days and two full nights to read it straight. It was that compelling, and um, it's it's magical. I mean, it, it it's magical, and and in many ways it makes it it makes it so much more impacting because you become involved with the people you're talking about. How did you come to write this book? Uh, it, it began a long time ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, back when I was in high school. Uh, was when I was first introduced to uh, survivors of Hiroshima. And a friend of mine, her father uh, was in the FBI. Uh, no one knew quite what he really did. It was, oh, you know, he does some forensic tax analysis or something like that. But he knew an awful lot about explosive events and what happens, you know, everything from uh, terrorist bombs to how volcanoes erupt and uh, educated me a lot on all of this. He was the first person who told me that there were people who survived both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, I did not know what he was involved in in the military, but I think he went to places where there were hijackings and bombings and such uh, because uh, there was one bombing where he had Suddenly he was out of town during the days after the bombing and uh, knew a lot and knew that I was getting interested in survivors and actually started introducing me to some of the survivors and telling me about the people who had survived both atomic bombs. And over the years I began uh, recording their stories as well as all the other topics that I was working on. Uh, along the way I met people like Walter Lord, who wrote A Night to Remember and uh, the uh, story of Midway and wrote about uh, you know, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He had actually interrogated at the end of the war some of the Japanese uh, uh, survivors of the war, including the guy who had led the raid on Pearl Harbor, who also was exposed to radiation in Hiroshima. And so Walter Lord, he started, you know, through him, if you read his books, you'll see that he started teaching me how to write history as well. So one thing led to another, and I learned from Walter Lord how you just uh, keep collecting these interviews with people, which is how he wrote all of his histories. And over the course of about 30 years, I ended up, uh, every time there was a survivor 
I interviewed them. I eventually went to Japan three times. Uh, by then, I was involved in the new emerging science of forensic archaeology and wanted to look at a few things in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which I followed up after having worked forensic archaeology in another place called Ground Zero, which was right at home in New York. When I began getting more and more involved, in fact, was I'm a 9-11 family member. <clears throat> On both sides, we lost people in this family. And in the ruins of Ground Zero, especially around this firehouse uh, called 1010 House, uh, there were these paper cranes being delivered. And there was a period of time when in Ground Zero, New York, everything was just a gray moonscape, basically, except for these bundles of colorful paper cranes, always in bundles of a thousand. And one of them, in fact, had a ribbon attached to it that said, come back to Hiroshima in Japanese. Uh -huh. And it was from Mr. Ito, who I actually ended up meeting in the family room in Ground Zero, and again in uh, Nagasaki. And he had lost his brother in Hiroshima and then grew up to, uh, when they were children, and then grew up to lose his son in Ground Zero, New York. And then there was this whole paper crane outreach program and uh, began meeting these, in my case, it was the Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors who were healing me and my family from what we went through. And so I ended up interviewing more and more and more survivors and still am. I guess I will for the rest of my life, or at least as long as there are survivors, be getting their stories down. Well, the the actual surviving of, you know, one or both of them, I, I mean, on top of the physical problems that they cause, and I do want to get back I, into that but but you know it's important for us to understand that people didn't just die they evaporated and and I don't think that the people understand um you t you take us back to shortly before the bomb you know has been dropped and 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 go millisecond by millisecond by millisecond well even smaller than that and you take us into Hiroshima and and what people were doing, and some of the amazing stories um, are, are just phenomenal. There was one lady who packed lunch for um, her children, and her son wouldn't take the lunch because he wasn't going to be there for lunchtime, and he wasn't. Um, these, right, these that's the been... sort of story that I heard over and over, the people who had premonitions. And, in fact, one of the double survivors, he was certain that his wife and his son were going to die in Nagasaki, which is why he was so desperate to get there. In fact, as soon as he arrived in Hiroshima, he was certain that this city was going to be destroyed. He and his two architect friends were working in every way possible to get their bosses to send them home to Nagasaki, and... They got permission that morning to take the train to Nagasaki, but the bomb went off first. And he knew that his wife and son were going to be killed by the same sort of thing and managed to get back to Nagasaki before it happened. But numerous, numerous stories of people who had these premonitions. And what's even stranger is the... I didn't just interview one person and then say, oh, network, who do I interview next? I went through the embassy. I went through, okay, I want to interview people who are here and there and at these different locations. And uh, it, it was almost random in my selection of interviews as, the time, as time went on. But I found that these people in two different cities, hundreds of thousands of people, populating these cities and yet the people I met they were all connected it was almost like that story that novel the bridge of San Luis Rey 
or some might, if you have seen the TV series a few years back, Lost, where you find out all these people, their lives are somehow interconnected before they ended up in that plane crash. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been living that <laughs> for real as I well. get to know more and more of these Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors so that by the time I was interviewing this one double atomic bomb survivor and he was telling me how this Dr. Nagai was his old baseball buddy, uh, a basketball buddy, and this is only two days after I had interviewed Nagai's grandson, and I was like, yeah, th- this isn't even surprising anymore at this point. <laughs> well, it's, I think that, that you know, uh, every, most people saw when they were in school um, films of the, um, the, the, the first trial, at uh, White Sands, and, and you, you saw the the picture of the the white flash, and then the the calm, and then the whoosh, and and yeah. Um, when when I was in when I when I was teaching school, the um, the assistant principal had been in the military at that time, and he was in a foxhole. Um, some miles away from the blast, but you know they put they put soldiers certain you know, in yeah. certain strategic places so they could, you know, test and see, if, you know, if it killed them or whatever. And he said... Yeah, especially they, during the tests they were doing in 1948, 1949, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he had, he, he had his hands over his eyes, and he said he could see his bones through, through the... You know, it was so bright that he could see his bones in, in his fingers that were, you know, covered by flesh still, but but that he saw right through his skin and everything and saw his bones. And um, he has to get tested, I think, every six months to make sure that he's still um, clean as far as cancer mm. and things like that go. But but these people had no idea what was coming. They were they were just, um, you know, you saw this this almost this, placidity of, of peacefulness and, and people doing their things and and then you you explain the the, the 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 flash which was brighter than sun. It was it was shy and what what I found fascinating was people were blinded by it who actually survived the blast and people who had um, problems with their eyes found that they no longer needed their glasses, which is strange. Right. Um, the overpressure in a couple of cases, it actually corrected people's vision. Uh, this one doctor who survived it and found uh, he was in a hospital and most of the hospital building was blown down and he was searching through and he found his glasses in the dust. And then he put his glasses on. He couldn't see anything until... Uh, he put his glasses on and then realized that his vision was even worse, took his glasses off, and by now the dust is beginning to clear, and he realized he didn't need his glasses. And he made the most amazing statement to me. He said, of course, I would not recommend nuclear nuclear detonations for corrective eye surgery. (laughs) And on the other extreme, there was a child, uh, Tanamori, and he was eight years old at the time and playing hide-and-seek in the school, in the schoolyard with his friends. And he was actually indoors near a window, and he had his, uh, he was it, and so he had his hands over his eyes, and his eyes were closed, and he saw his bones through his, eyes, his, his fingers, through his closed eyelids, just like you described that uh, people... Uh, he saw the basically the skeleton of his skeleton of his fingers being backlit right through closed eyes. It was, and he could never forget that. He said, "I wash my hands, and as soon as my hands touch my face, I feel that again." Wow. Now, and he also the, felt the this incredible heat passing through his body at the same time. And several people have described that heat as if 
a man made of fire just stepped right through you, uh, through your, through your chest, and out through your back, and just walked right through you. Now the the Hiroshima bomb was was made to detonate in the air, so it never, you know, it didn't make a big hole in the ground. But what what I was fascinated with with was the, the power that it had, literally disintegrated people. Right. There, if and, you were and, under the bomb out to a radius of about four to five hundred feet, uh, just uh, ima- the people that we've mentioned who saw their bones through their fingers, through their fingers and through closed eyelids, they were more than a mile away. Directly under it, <clears throat> that same light that would shine right through the back of your skull and uh, because Yamaguchi, who we'll get to uh, later, the double atomic bomb survivor, who was within the fringe of ground zero both times, in Hiroshima that was a little more than a mile away where every building around you got knocked down, he had dove immediately into a ditch in a potato field, and his face was down, and yet the light was shining through his skull bright enough that he could still the light was still painful. It was shining through his skull and hitting his retinas. Now, much closer to the bomb, out to a radius of about four or 500 feet, the temperature was much higher than the surface of the sun and the light passing through you. It heated your, the entire inside of your body up to uh, about the temperature of the surface of the sun. And we are talking well, about I, much, much brighter than the sun because a fission atomic bomb, which the Hiroshima and the Nagasaki bombs were, a fission nuclear weapon, which is, a, is actually hot enough to create fusion, to create the temperatures that are at the very center of the sun. So you can imagine being only about four or five hundred feet from that. Wow, I just you know it it it, it does boggle the mind. Now I'm not sure which which city it was, but at one point and and people who were ground zero were hit by this light, were hit by the heat, um, literally disintegrated, and the last part of the body to actually disintegrate were the teeth. And, and there were places where, where there were crowds of people where all you saw were the teeth on the ground. Right. There were several places where this happened. It was noticed in Hiroshima at crosswalks and so on. And there were these whirlwinds of fire in and around uh, the center of the city. Uh, they called, the children called them fireworms. They were actually tornadoes of fire. And much as if you were panning for gold, you tend to find little nuggets of the same size, things of the gr- same grain size usually get deposited together. And when we're talking about whirling winds like a mini tornado, it's acting almost like a river depositing things of the same size. This happens in most uh, gravity currents and in explosive events, including when the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed and objects were being jetted out of uh, buildings as the floors compressed. Odd things like this happened all the time, so that most uh, part of a legal library landed two blocks away. All of the books traveled together. And some of them landed in a fire escape above O'Hara's Pub in New York City. And the papers and books were still in alphabetical order. And uh, same thing. Teeth are about, are, you know, the same grain size roughly. So from probably a couple of hundred feet around, these whirlwinds deposited the teeth mostly in the same place. It just, um, I was it. What was it that that disintegrated them? Was it the light? Was it the heat? It would have been the I mean, well, the light. 
uh, this intense light passing through, it will pass straight through the body. The x-rays and so on uh, tend to go right through. The light tends to, the visible spectrum of light tends to get stopped by the body. And so it will deliver its energy all through your body. And suddenly uh, your body goes up to five, ten times the uh, boiling point of water and literally erupts. And uh, in Pompeii's sister city of Herculaneum, I had studied this, where you had the same temperatures involved, you had very, very hot air involved, and people disintegrated, the iron separated from the blood under the bodies in the Herculaneum marina. There's uh, about one-sixteenth of an inch thick where the iron separated from the blood and you had a layer under the people of carbon steel. So in the center of Hiroshima, people would have uh, disintegrated and uh, almost like a shadow under their body, you would have had for a fraction of a second a layer of carbon steel boiling on the sidewalk like a cup of hot coffee and then the blast wave hit. Now, it depended on, what I found fascinating was it, it depended on the color that you wore, the white or black, how how the the light affected you. Right. So there were people who were wearing such things as a striped shirt or a dress with a flower pattern on it, and the white would reflect the light away from you. And so if your clothing was light, was white, it would protect you, but if you were wearing something like a stripe pattern or a flower pattern, the darker ink would absorb the light, and this is if you're a mile away and uh-huh. th- and you survived, and it would absorb the light and brand the image of a flower or a stripe pattern from your jacket onto your skin. And that stayed forever. It was like a tattoo. Right. There was a teacher who was putting children's calligraphy, and it was the calligraphy of the children's names, or some of them had written the name of the teacher, and she was putting some of the nicest calligraphy up on the windows of the schoolroom when the Hiroshima bomb detonated. And so it was black ink on white paper. The white paper reflected the light. The ink absorbed the black ink absorbed the light and then burned instantly away and so that that piece of paper for the rays that came through after that instant in which the black ink disappeared and it seared the letters that a child had painted with a paintbrush onto her forehead uh, onto her head and just barely missed one of her eyes and so the white protected her eyes but she had the uh a child's name branded on her head. And years and years later when they said, look, we can remove that scarring. And she said, it was the last thing a child wrote. I want to keep it with me in memory of that child. Uh Now, at ground zero, there was nothing. And and then... Um, Well, actually, um, that's the strangest thing about uh, the the over-the-hypocenter. Generally, in Grand Zero, reaching out almost to a mile from Hiroshima, buildings were stamped flat, and trees were knocked over, generally in the direction away from the bomb. Sometimes a tree leaned forward, and then as the uh, vacuum effect dissipated and things were drawn back toward the bomb, Uh, Some trees went forward and then leaned back and broke back facing the bomb. But basically everything was either facing the explosion or, or, or blasted down, knocked down away from the explosion until you got under the hypocenter, until you were almost directly under the bomb. And that's where things like the famous image everyone sees of what's called the atomic dome which has uh, later evolved into where they call it the Peace Dome, and that famous dome in the center of Hiroshima where 
it somehow withstood the blast. And all the trees standing around it, even though the trees were turned mostly into charcoal, their trunks were still facing straight up toward the bomb. So the shock wave, this hemisphere of a shock wave came down toward the ground, went down along the sides of buildings and went down along the sides of trees, and then it blasted outward. So so there was um, the light and then a concussion? That it, right. That it was... So, so, so tell if me you were right bit. under the bomb, you had almost two-tenths of a second before the blast hit you. If you were a little more than a mile away, uh, you know, a mile and a half away, you had five or six seconds before the blast hit you. And that did further damage. Um, explain, you, you've, you've spoken about, um, in, in the book you talk about the shadow people, which... Um, it's haunting. Do you want to explain what they were? Yeah, uh, that, uh, and in fact, there were, mil- there were shadow people, there were shadow animals, shadows of plants. So if a wall behind a bush survived the blast, if there were a bush that was actually hit by the light, the wall would fade or it would you know, it would be stained by the light itself, almost like flash photography. So there were images mm-hmm. facing away from the bomb. There were images of people, images of uh, horses. In fact, on one of the bridges near the hypocenter, they could just about make out by the bleaching of the road where the hooves of a horse had been, the wagon the horse had been carrying, a man who had been walking with the horse. There were the footsteps of people on the bridges. And then further away, you saw full images of people against walls. And inside buildings, you would see shadows cast by window frames. If the building survived, you would see shadows of where chairs were, uh, plants left shadows on the roads, on walls. And when the atomic bombing survey came in, it is through these hundreds and hundreds of shadows throughout the city that they were able to figure out within about five or six feet, just tracing the direction of shadows and doing triangulation hundreds of times. That's how they were able to determine exactly where the hypocenter was, exactly the five or six foot area of the ground above which the bomb had detonated. Now, a lot of and the, they the detonated people... at an altitude of eighteen hundred and fifty feet. Ah, I was so wondering how high is, it was. Yeah, to have that effect from that height. And and you know this sounds horrific, and it is, but it's not the worst of it. Um. I, I, I think that, the, you know, just, just that kind of a blast um, exposing people to it is enough to um, have someone have their their mind scrambled. But on top of all of that, where was the radiation? Was the radiation in the, in the, um, the impact of the, um, the concussion? <clears throat> was the radiation within the light? Where, where did the radiation... The radiation came from the detonation point of the bomb it was most of it initially was produced from an area no as hotter than the center of the sun but no wider than an apple or an orange and so there were gamma rays which are very much like x-rays and if you're close to that you're going to get a lethal dose Uh, Mr. Yamaguchi was just shy of it. He was one of the double survivors. He was just shy of uh, just over a mile away and just shy of a mile and a half. And luckily, between him and the bomb, the deadly gamma radiation uh, just in the atmosphere, if you have a mile, 1.2 miles of atmosphere between you and the Hiroshima bomb, the 
atmosphere has moisture in it, so that is like having about six feet of water between you and the source of the radiation. Water mm-hmm. is very good protection against radiation, so uh, against the prompt radiation, which would be the gamma rays. The spray of neutrons would have been mostly stopped by it. Uh, not uh, things that made fillings in people's teeth vibrate and partly melt. There were also these very strange particles that were probably fractured uranium particles that were sent flying in all directions uh, at about one-third to one-half, up to maybe 70% the speed of light. And so when they went through you, they actually made a path through your body about maybe one-hundredth to one-two-hundredth the width of uh uh, one, uh, the width of a human hair, but they would burn a path straight through your body and uh, explode every red blood cell, every piece of DNA that they pass through. And even at a distance of almost 10 miles away by the time the bomb detonated, those heavy ions traveling at high fractions of the speed of light went right through the pilots of the planes, right through the crews of the planes. Uh, They felt the fillings in their teeth vibrating and emitting a taste like molten lead. So people got exposed to a lot of that as well. And the, but most of it you were shielded from by the atmosphere itself if you were far enough away. What got Yamaguchi, what burned him was the visible spectrum of light, the things we normally see in the world around us, Uh, the color of trees, the color of uh, roses, the natural colors we see were so intensely bright that they could burn your skin. And that's what happened to Yamaguchi. He received flash burns on one side of his body. Now, um, what what fascinated me was that, you know, they knew it was a bomb, obviously, but it 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 took. Um, they didn't understand that it was a nuclear bomb, so that so that it, it took several people a while to figure out that it it that there was radiation here as well. Because one of the things that that happened with the radiation, and I'm not exactly sure why, but it it gave people a, an incredible thirst. They were they were they were so thirsty. They just you know they they looked for water everywhere, and then black black rain came, and right. the rain was contaminated as well, so that so that they were reinfecting themselves by drinking the black rain. Right, so what happened was directly under the bomb, out to about roughly 500 feet out from the bomb, further than that, but the most intense radioactive fallout was everything that was irradiated by particles coming off from the bomb directly under the bomb. And that would have been all the way down through about the top couple of inches of uh, the earth. And everything that was hit by fast neutrons, slow neutrons, by heavy ions. Uh, During that instant, every element, every isotope that ever has or ever will exist uh, throughout the history of the galaxy, every element was created. And most of them lasted only a fraction of a second, but that was enough for them to hit the ground, to create new isotopes, and you had this tremendous explosion that created a vacuum in the place where the bomb had been, and then you had an implosion. So you had a shock bubble that was more than a half mile wide. And then after about one and a half seconds, it collapses and implodes, and it's also superheated air, so it's going to the cloud that forms is going to want to rise into the sky very quickly. And that, uh, that pulled much of the radiation, radioactive fallout, it became fallout, 
broken concrete, broken houses, broken roof tiles, disintegrated people. It pulled the most, much of that material up into the sky where it condensed with all the vaporized water and then came down as this black rain. And anything that was in the path of that black rain, many of these isotopes had very fast half-lives, meaning they decayed very rapidly. But anyone who was within the first 15 or 20 minutes downwind receiving that black rain uh, received high doses of radioactive fallout, high doses of radiation. So there's the prompt radiation from the flash And then there's the fallout, the secondary radiation, which the scientists really, not even the people who created and then dropped the bomb, expected the black rain. They didn't expect that. And they were horrified by it. In fact, one of them actually, uh, Harold Urey, who worked out the uranium separation techniques, and he was one of the ones I got to know uh, when I was growing up, and He had said initially after the bombings that when humanity sees what science has done, they will see immediately that here is the end of war. And when he saw us building more and more bombs and knew that then Russia, the new enemy, would build atomic bombs and then maybe other countries, he had a complete nervous breakdown afterward for his involvement in it. Yeah. I, I can understand. I mean, Einstein was horrified. Um, I think that the the other fascinating thing that that um, I, I that, that you brought up in your book was the minute that the bomb was dropped, another plane also dropped a canister that had a letter from scientists to the scientists yeah. in Japan. Right, Luis Alvarez, who with his son is the he wrote that letter, composed it, and he dropped these letters in his scientific monitoring equipment, which radioed out all the data from the explosion. And Luis Alvarez was one, another one of the ones I knew. I had been involved in New Zealand when his son discovered the dinosaur uh, extinction layer, the platinum group elements from an asteroid impact a few meters below where I was digging for other things. (laughs) And I got to know Luis Alvarez, and it was the one subject that somehow I knew was never to be discussed. I don't recall anyone ever telling me not to discuss it, uh, but uh, anything about the atomic bomb. And we it's interestingly the whole thing that came out of the dinosaur-asteroid connection was – when Lewis and Walter Alvarez and Carl Sagan were talking, uh, then arose the theory of nuclear winter in the event of a nuclear war. And then I was uh, doing some numbers uh, because what I was working on also was ancient climate during the times of mammalian extinctions, dinosaur extinctions, and so on. And that's what I was doing with my postdoc time. And, uh, I looked at a few things of all these forests burning that would produce all the soot after a nuclear war, and I said there would follow a nuclear summer, which might be even worse than the nuclear winter. And uh, so then we were, of course, meeting with people in Australia and so on about their ideas about a coming uh, global warming from putting carbon dioxide and methane and other things in the atmosphere. We weren't the first to think of it, though. If you remember, there were movies in the 1970s like Soylent Green and Silent Running that uh, mentioned the possibility of global warming and that it would lead to food shortages and they would lead to nuclear war. Well, I think that's the other thing that that – the people and and, and I, I want to point out here and we're, and hope to I hope to remember to point it out several times as we go along. We're following um, people and we're talking about people who were not military. This was mm. not army. This was these these were um, you know people trying to to live a life uh, in, in a in a in a time of war where their food and 
everything that that they had used, you know, that they were used to, had been cut so so extraordinarily that they were on that point of starvation to begin with. So we used this horrendous weapon against people who were 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 just trying to survive. They, right, and, and none, in you fact, know, Japan. Japan at that time, we don't know how many, but we do know of people who were ready to rebel against the warlords and the government. The warlords uh were out of their minds. I mean, not many people know the emperor was actually held prisoner in his own palace. He was sacred, so they couldn't kill him, but they killed some of his men. And he was held prisoner in his palace for even talking, thinking, uttering words suggesting it might be time to surrender. And uh, yeah. there, there was a palace I, I, revolt that not many people know of. These warlords, some of them were of the mind that every last person in Japan must be sacrificed. And one of them, he had said, uh, Arisu, he said, well, it's just, I hear the atomic bomb over Hiroshima was so beautiful that it looked like a flower all of our people should die like flowers falling. I mean, that's nuts. That's very nuts. And I but think what, the what I found were fascinating... people on the verge of rebelling. In fact, Dr. Akazuki, one of the people in the book, he had to be held back by his friend from hitting a soldier in the back of the head with a shovel when they came and took all the medicine, what little medicine they had. Yeah, this was after the bomb went off. Um yeah. I, I think what what um, really got to me was that after after the second bomb, um, the warlords or whoever were were saying that they knew they knew it was an atomic weapon at that point, and they kept saying the the U.S. only had enough plutonium for three bombs. Right, and they, they figured they, it out. Yes. Yeah. And they figured so, it so out. They, by, yeah. And, in fact, Dr. <laughs> Nishina's uranium bomb, the one that he designed, and he had a picture in his office that had been drawn, painted, of his bomb fired from a submarine and the Golden Gate Bridge flying apart. And the thing about the Nishina bomb is that the geometry of his uranium bomb design, Hiroshima was a uranium bomb uh, Nagasaki was a plutonium bomb. Dr. Nishina's design was a better design. And he's well, one of I... the ones that they flew into Hiroshima who went and he found the broken teeth, uh, the cross section, uh, uh, crosswalk area where there were hundreds and hundreds of broken teeth, and he brought a Geiger counter to uh, a handful of molars and one of the generals who went with him said, is this, is that, the doctors said when he saw the clicks, he said, that's it, it's an atomic bomb. And the guy said to Nishina, he said, that's it. He said, that quickly, that's it. He, Nishina said, this is it. We need to get the warlords to understand there is no defense if they have these things. And uh, well, the then... Sagan figured out that they could only have three atomic bombs with all their manufacturing facilities and that they would have tested one and they must now be down to maybe two atomic bombs. And after Nagasaki was arguing, we should continue the fight. Yes. Um, and when when Hirohito um, surrendered, didn't some of the warlords commit suicide because they were just... Yes, yes. Yes, they, uh, their plan, there was a rebellion against the warlords by some of the warlords themselves. So there was a rebellion against the ones who wanted the war to go on. And in the end, uh, several of them, uh, you know, committed uh, suicide on the palace lawn. Uh, one went back home, wrote his death poems, wrote an apology to the emperor, and uh, then uh, he managed to mess up his attempt to kill himself. It took him about four hours to die. 
But since oh he was gosh. one of the people who was behind the biological weapons experiments in China, uh, uh-huh. that particular guy, it, he couldn't have suffered enough. <laughs> but, uh, wow. you know, the, the emperor was in a very strange position. I mean, he was held prisoner in his own palace. He had actually managed to make two recordings of his surrender, and when the uh, palace revolt finally ended, they broadcast his voice over the radio, his one of the two copies of that that and, he'd and recorded that the, on the 78 RPM records. Was that the first time the people had actually heard him speak? Yes. It was the very first time they ever heard his voice. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> well, I, I want to get back to some of these the, the people whose lives you follow because um, – I mean, the in a time like this, there the humanity in 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 the people just poured forth unbelievably. You, you had people helping people um, that they didn't know. Oh, tell the story of of the one man who who was newly married because that was oh Kenshi Hirata. Part- that is one of the yeah. love stories of all time. It, it, it's complicated, too. He had just been married, and uh, he brought his wife to Hiroshima, and he was an accountant, and he, their home was located practically right under the bomb. It was very close. She was one of the ones who, in about one Faster the nerves could fire, she no longer the nerves themselves no longer existed. So the one thing about being that close to the bomb is it was absolutely painless. And he was a mile and a half away, almost two miles away, in one of the Mitsubishi complexes. He was the only one who ever survived in his office. And the reason he survived is at the moment of the flash, he heard a woman's voice that he initially felt might have been, he heard or felt a woman's voice stay undercover or get undercover. And he got un, he dove down to the floor behind a desk and stayed there. Now, the disconcerting thing about the atomic bomb is people saw a flash and the country, what, another thing most people forget or have never heard is over 60 cities had already been firebombed throughout Japan, including one-third of Tokyo. And so the people were training for bombings. And usually a bomb would land nearby, you would see the flash, and you would dive to the ground. You would have maybe a fraction of a second, be, a half second before the blast wave and debris hit you. And so people were practiced on diving to the ground, and then the blast would go over and you would get up. And what happened when you're about two miles away, there is this very bright flash outside, and then it fades, but there's no explosion. One second Uh goes by, two seconds, three, four, five seconds go by. Five seconds is a long time. People started getting up and looking at the window, and then the blast wave hit. And uh, those people, everyone in that room who was standing was either instantly killed or Kenshi Hirata, who had been to war and who had been wounded and had injuries to his legs, he knew from his medical service uh, in the Pacific arena that the people he saw who were still moving around were in such bad shape, so badly mangled that they wouldn't be living much longer. He went outside, he saw this huge cloud rising up into the sky on a stem and then breaking away in a second mushroom stalk rising behind it and all he could think of was his wife Sesiko and he would have never been exposed to radiation at all because he was away from the direction of the fallout and he went running back toward the center of town and a lot of the city was burning but near the hypocenter much of the wood had been pretty much instantly turned into charcoal and then the bits of it hoisted up into the air. So you only had the foundations of houses. There was apparently nothing left to burn. 
or the blast had put the fires out. In any case, when he got into the center of the town where there was nothing but foundations of buildings, he was able to find by street patterns where his house was, but there was no fire. So he was able to be there and believe it or not, in the center of town, under the bomb, because most of the upper surface of soil, most of everything that had been disintegrated was hoisted up into the cloud, there was actually less radiation in the center of right under where the bomb had detonated because the bomb had lifted the the mushroom cloud had formed by lifting much of that away uh, that the radiation he received was less than if you were a mile uh, further away to the northwest than where he ended up going, found the foundations of the house, spent the next day uh, searching for his wife. He had his rations with him. He That night, I mean, things were very frightening, but he didn't want to leave. He felt that if she is here, I do not want her spirit to be alone during the night. So he laid down on this still you know, pretty, in, it was radioactive enough to make you sick within a few hours. But, uh, you know, he stayed on that radioactive ground. He did get ill and he did miraculously survive. He must have had an incredible immune system. And uh, he stayed there. Friends found him the next day They and he found the ashes of his wife There was enough to be able to tell that she had been sitting uh, in or near the kitchen when it happened. And he found their wedding bowl, a metal bowl that was still somehow mostly intact. And he had decided, I have to bring her ashes home to her parents. And home, in his case, was Nagasaki, right where the second atomic bomb was going to explode. Yeah, and <clears throat> I don't think the, the 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 shock of all of this, for, for, you know, forget forget that. I mean, it, they didn't know about the radioactivity, so that so that you know they they were they were getting sick, they were vomiting, they were very thirsty. They you know there was a lot going on, but there was also the fact that they were in in shock to a degree that was phenomenal and that, I mean, a lot of this affected their brains as well so that the people that were still alive were, um, you know, they, they didn't know what to do, where to go, or how to do anything. And, and I, I think they, they right, called the them the people who walked people. in trails yeah, and uh, where one would just follow the other. And there were these long lines of people walking over piles of debris where right nearby was an intact road and a smooth road that they could have walked over. And some of these people, children call them, you know, where there would be trails in their backyards, they would see trails of ants. Children Uh had called them the ant walkers. And so, uh, and some of them survived. One of the people I write about, Dr. Haichia, of Hiroshima, he was in that kind of shock, and for no reason that he was aware of, he was just following uh, behind the person in front of him, and then a couple of people got behind him and followed him, and he was walking possibly for a couple of hours. Uh, And looking back on it, he said afterwards, strangely, not even caring that all of my clothes had been blown off of my body. Mhm. Yeah, it, it's just it. Um, you, your your heart breaks for these people. These these were not enemies. These were people like you and I, and and they were they were in such shock that um, you know you think about things like the death marches and things like that. But it was it it was so different. The, there were children. Um, and and in many cases, um, you know, the the one case um, where the little boy had bent over to pick up a coin, and oh, the yeah. children, 
Yeah, tell that one. That's that's Yeah, the Nakazawa boy. He was actually talking with a classmate's mother at the time. And Uh uh he became he grew up to become a very famous artist in in Japan and was in fact one of the people who was behind the early Godzilla uh things the whole beginning of the manga movement you know graphic novels uh mm-hmm. that are a thing now in America and uh Nakazawa was talking to the mother of a classmate and he was standing near a wall in the schoolyard, pretty darn close to the bomb, <clears throat> within a mile. Uh, but the wall, he was just, he bent down to pick something up. The wall, and he was just the right height where the wall protected him, except for the top of his head, where the light went across uh, part of his head and just burned his scalp off, burned the hair off, burned the scalp off almost as if a saber of light had gone across the back of his head and the woman he had been talking to was completely she was fully exposed to the light on one side of her body and uh, uh, basically one side of her body was uh, you know just very worse than third degree burns and she was blasted about 60 feet away from him died instantly, and uh, Nakazawa's mother was in a house also near the explosion point, and she was pregnant uh, near term and had been hanging out the laundry when the blast occurred. The house shadow shielded her from the rays, and the balcony she was standing on was actually hauled off of the house, uh, just pulled right off of the house, and was whirling around and somehow landed very gently on the ground while the house itself were destro- was destroyed. And, uh, you know, the husband and daughter died inside. Yeah, it's, it's, it's frightening. But you so... had this case where both the mother and the child were uh, shadow-shielded and then shock-cocooned. Uh, shock-cocoon is where... There's these small spots around any explosive event where things seem to be in a safe place. We don't feel fully understand it yet, but it's as if the person is held within a cocoon and protected, where the forces just diverge around someone, or you know, a part of a house can be pulled off and whirled around and will land just gently on the ground where everything around it is completely torn to just splinters of wood. And there there was also, um, <clears throat> you spoke of a soldier who, um, I, I think it was the Hiroshima bomb, he he was in a form of shock, I guess, and his he felt that he had to go and collect the code, the code books, books. And then... yeah, yeah. He went into ta- into uh, the center of Hiroshima, obsessed with finding this code book. Many people seem to obsess on absurd details, and when he finally brought the burned up code book to someone in the military, it was like, "What are you doing this for? Why did you do this?" And uh, it seemed, oddly, that it was the young adults. I mean, people who were teenagers, uh, trolley car work people and so on, which those jobs, trolley car drivers and repairmen, they were mostly young girls of 15 and 16. And believe it or not, it was the trolley workers, mostly kids, who organized rescue and turned the few surviving trolley cars, found what roads were workable for the trolley tracks, and over those days after the explosion, in both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, began the work of rescue and reuniting survivors of families across town. Oddly, the same thing happened in San Francisco during the San Francisco earthquake in 1906, where those Mm -hmm. in charge in positions of authority were 
basically useless. And where it was people you would never think of, uh, they were the real le- natural leaders, but never knew it until havoc struck. And it again, it turned out to be the cab drivers and trolley drivers in San Francisco who organized the rescue in 1906. And you see this a lot throughout history. Well, now, now there was one train that left Hiroshima. And um, there were kind of like reserved seats on it, or what? You know, priority seats. Right. And um, was Mr. Yakamura was he one of those that that got a seat on? He had to get to the train station. And, and uh, it took Yamaguchi. Him, right. He finally Yamaguchi, got to the yeah. train station. Kenshi Hirata got to the train station. There were two trains that went out of Hiroshima south to Nagasaki. And uh, over 300 people left, survived Hiroshima and got out on the last train to Nagasaki. And of the peop- those more than 300, there are about 30 we know of who survived the second atomic bombing. It appears that about 90% of them did not survive the second atomic bombing. And... One reason for that being also that the second atomic bomb was more than twice as powerful. The Hiroshima bomb flashed desiccated leaves on trees out to a distance where one side of the uh, tree over the next few days turned brown, the side facing Mm -hmm. the bomb. In Nagasaki, that happened out to 50 miles. In fact, people suffered burns pretty serious burns 40 miles away from Nagasaki. Uh, Had the Nagasaki bomb detonated over California, for example, during a dry season or over Oregon or Washington State, it would have created a hurricane of fire 100 miles wide. And that was the effect of a baby atomic bomb. Nothing like what would really be used in a full-scale nuclear war today. Now, those, or even a momentary far, spasm of nuclear exchange. How far is Nagasaki from Hiroshima? Uh, I, think, I think it's over 300 miles. So I'd have to so double-check pe- that. It's over 300 miles, well, yeah. Okay, so so that so that Nagasaki probably didn't really know or understand about what had gone on at Hiroshima, except they'd been bombed. So right, uh, the when, radio, the government told people that there had been an incident in Hiroshima. There was some damage, and that's all that the public knew. Uh, at one of the prison camps for POWs, one of the work-to-death camps, which was 40 miles north of Nagasaki, uh, they saw the Hiroshima flash. Mm -hmm. So the flash from Hiroshima was visible more than 300 miles away. Well, uh, they were working in mines, the the prisoners of war. So yeah. that so that they and and they were digging these tunnels to protect precious things and and people, um, from from the bombings and people did use them as shelter. Um, unfortunately, once they came out of the shelter, they still got hit by the radiation. Yes. Uh, depending and which what, direction you were. So in, in Hiroshima, if you were in the north west that that was the direction of the fallout in uh-huh. Nagasaki the fallout went over the mountains and it went uh, all the way east and in fact 40 miles to the east farmland was uh, dusted with radioactive fallout and people got sick a year later who had been pretty far away from here from Nagasaki and especially children, they got ill a year later and almost some died. I have the account of one who almost died 
and he was safe from the radiation, except that when he went to his parents' farm to the east of Nagasaki and eating the food over the next year, that is how he got exposed. And yeah, there's there a family was... right here in New York City where uh, uh, they, the after the war, there were actually families in the Japanese-American internment camps that were deported from the United States back to Japan. And the Furumoto family, when they got to Japan, the Japanese people were, well, you're from the country that, uh, won the war. Uh, we don't like you. So they were sent to grow their food in the ruins of Hiroshima, and he lost family members to cancer growing up in and eating the food in Hiroshima. And for all of it, they were a very patriotic family. They uh-huh. worked their way. You know, it was a government program deporting people back to Japan. So Furumoto's sister, they forgot to revoke her American citizenship. And so she was able to come back and then get a job and then one by one bring Tak Furumoto and his family members back. And for a while, Tak Furumoto ended up working with this man, Joseph Fuchita, when he started a real estate business here. He had to work by himself in a real estate office alone for a while because he was suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress, after having volunteered as an officer after college and served in Vietnam and experienced uh, you know, those tunnels in Vietnam and the tunnel rats and the ambushes and everything. So he came to New York and he started a real estate business. Now, it's the only person in the world I know who had exposure to Hiroshima radiation. He probably is the only person in the world exposed to Hiroshima radiation exposed to Agent Orange in NAM, exposed to ground zero dust in the air in New York. Oh, and he also worked with Donald Trump. <laughs> so he was exposed <laughs> to Donald Trump. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, he, and I'll get back to Joseph Fuchita in a moment. In the 1980s, uh, Tak Furumoto was one of very few people in America able to speak Japanese and English because after the war, because of the internment, the uh, prisons uh, that we had throughout the country for West Coast Japanese Americans, uh, the Japanese families did not teach their children the language, the culture, or anything. They were afraid internment camps might happen again in the future, They or bad memories. Uh, you did not have people who grew up after the war in America in Japanese families who spoke Japanese. So he was one of only about two people in New York who, when Japan began profiting in the late 70s and into the 80s and began buying real estate, that he could be the translator and the real estate uh, developer, dealer at the same time. And so he was also working with Donald Trump. Now, this guy, Joseph Uchida, was the son of the man who had led, who had flown Dr. Nishina into Hiroshima. So, uh, but that man was also the man who, uh, he had survived too many remarkable things. There's, Numerous plane incidents, including when he was going down in the Pacific and there was a Chinese boat seven miles ahead of him, and the only that was the closest thing to land in sight. He crashed his plane near these, this Chinese boat. Now, Japan was doing terrible things to China, but it was the only chance he had, and he figured, they're going to kill me, but it's the only chance I have. I mean, a Chinese captain, what could he be happier with than a Japanese pilot crashing near him? Uh, the captain rescued him instead. And months later, he's on a mission through Chitta, and he actually, there's a boat going down, and he rescues the crew of that boat, and it's the same captain of the same Chinese boat that saved him. Oh, and uh, now, B-52 
before all these plane incidents and all these other things that Fuchida survived before he had his son Joseph, he was also the lead. He survived midway. He got blown out the side of the aircraft carrier that had led the raid on Pearl Harbor. Uh, he survived that. He had also survived 19 bullet holes in the airplane with which he had led the raid on Pearl Harbor. So when Takfuramoto was working with this man's son, it was, don't tell Donald Trump, because there was a lot of, in the 80s, you suddenly had all this anti-Japanese uh, and coming from people like uh, Lee Iacocca, uh, mm-hmm. who you know, actually used terms like yellow peril because Japan, Japan was building better cars than he was. And more oh, people geez. wanted to buy Japan's cars. So, but there was a lot of negative saying uh, against Japanese and Asians and uh, Asians in general at that time. And so, yeah. Takfuramoto said, "Don't tell Trump who your father was. There's enough PTSD <laughs> in the world." Yeah. Well, let let me get back to Nagasaki here because yeah. there was a lot there was a lot that that went on there that and and the the gentleman that took the bones of his his wife back was right. there in time to get it you know by by another flash um i i think the thing that that in, that, that was so amazing is that in times like that um everyone comes together everyone works everyone um tries to help one another there's there's no Hoarding. There was no. Um, everyone was numb. It appears. And um, right, Kenji Hirata duck- had been rescued in Hiroshima by his friend who owned a lumber mill. Uh-huh. And after he found it, that he helped him find his wife's ashes, and he had been saving food in this time of terrible rationing. He had some dried fish and some white rice left. And uh, he brought his friend to the house. And Kenshi, he was beginning to feel the effects of radiation, but more so than anything else, he did not want to use the last of his friend's food. So he you know, just said, I'm really not hungry. Just give me a little rice to make as an offering to my wife a few grains of rice. And he wanted to leave his friend with whatever food he had left. And Uh then uh, he went on that train, and he went back to Nagasaki, and he stopped at his parents' house and was walking with his father toward the parents of his wife to bring the ashes to her. And on the way to her house, the second atomic bomb detonated. And what's amazing here is he was within a zone where he should have died instantly, there was a hill, and the hill actually completely shielded him and his father from the blast and uh, from the flash and the blast. So only a few hundred feet away, all the grass was burned black, the, where, they were, where things were not in the shadow of the hill. Beyond them, further from the atomic blast, the, glass was, the grass was black, trees were knocked down. And where he was, a few shingles were uh, blown off buildings, the ball was blown out of his hand, but dragonflies were still flying around, and the grass was all still green, and the uh, the trees still had leaves on them. He was in this one little spot of green and of birds and insects still being alive in the middle of all this blackness, where everything else basically turned to Chocolate. Yeah, it's it's just it, it's amazing, and um, I think it was it was it Dr. Nagi that had leukemia. That yeah, and he was in a part of the hospital. That hospital was close enough that if you were in the front offices, you got a dose of radiation that was enough that you had about a fifty-fifty chance of dying from the prompt radiation dose. 
and the black rain did not reach the hospital. It went in another direction, but the prompt radiation dose, the gamma rays, the neutron spray, and in the case of the plutonium bomb, there was also a flash of microwave radiation, so that if someone had been holding a lunchbox, the metal intercepted it, and your hand was burned where you were holding the lunchbox. And it was a Christian community in Nakasaki, in Orakami, where the bomb detonated. And so people who had been wearing a little chain with a crucifix, the metal intercepted microwaves and burned it onto their skin. That did not happen okay. in Hiroshima. It happened only in Nakasaki. We don't know why that there was this the, microwave surge. Doctor, doc, it, was it Dr. Nagy that, that went back to where his home was? And uh, he had been, he had leukemia. Right, um, right. He they, was a they, doctor he, dying of leukemia. He had a very short time to live. He was basically in a hospice section in his own hospital, but he kept getting up to work. He uh, got up and went to the dark room to develop some films, and that was near the hospice area, but he was not in those front office areas that I mentioned where you could get a lethal dose of radiation. He was further back in the hospital where you got a little less of a dose of radiation, but enough of a dose of prompt radiation to basically rapidly dividing cells in your body would be killed, and those would be mm -hmm. cancer cells. And he actually <laughs> went into remission from cancer. Yeah, and he's the one that, that not only lived through it, but he went back and he built, his, he, he built a, a shack on, on, right. on the place where his home was, and he he continued to treat people from there, and people, you know, tried to offer him money and everything else. He, and he didn't want the money. He just he wanted to help people. It was just the most amazing right. thing. That, and he also that, decided he had a science background, so he also decided to take notes. He saw uh -huh. that nature was starting to recover. Throughout the autumn, he saw that. Ants came back and other things were coming back and spiders were coming back. So he started taking notes about all this, and he built his little home in the middle of it and uh, began studying what was going on, began helping people, built up a little library in there, and uh, it was also a place where he meditated and prayed. And... Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, and he wrote all of these books. In fact, I think under the current Pope of the Catholic Church, Pope Francis, Dr. Nagai mm -hmm. is now up to one of the very last stages to sainthood. Also another friend really? of Mr. Yamaguchi, who I believe he actually was sainted, was a priest who had been in Nagasaki who then was uh, <clears throat> arrested, and mm -hmm. he ended up in Auschwitz, and where he ministered to people and helped people, and a man had tried to, had been accused of stealing bread, and this priest came up and uh, said that he was the one who stole the bread, this other man didn't. And that he had done, you know, he uh, he said that in Japan the priest's nickname was Simpko. That was, a, and uh, he was from Poland originally. And Mr. Yamaguchi always knew him as Father Simpko. And <clears throat> he took the place and was executed in the place of this man. And he had explained to someone the story survived. He had no family. He wanted this man who had children who still might be alive out there somewhere to have a chance to see his family again. So he was executed in Auschwitz, and Yamaguchi, who survived both atomic bombs, and in a time of severe depression after the war, he was emotionally just shattered, 
and dealing a lot with survivor's guilt. Why did a quarter million people die in these, in, and why am I still here? And mm-hmm. he saw there was no logic, there was no anything in the world, everything was random. And then he learned what happened to his friend from years earlier. And he said, no, this is my second life. And if this is my second life, I must live life in the way that this man who took the place of another man in Auschwitz, and I must live my life the way he would have had me live. And then he helped rebuild schools in Nagasaki and then went into the schools to teach there. And he lived Uh at the age of 94. I know. It was amazing. And preaching peace and what in America we would call the pay it forward principle, what in Japan goes by a couple of names, Noyakoto, Omoyari, and uh, he preached those things uh, till his last days. Well, you know, it's um, one of the other stories I want to and make sure we get in not only preached it, here. but lived it. That's the thing. He not only preached it, but he lived it every day. Oh, yeah, that's 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 much more important. Um, I, I tell the story of the thousand cranes because that is one of the most oh. touching stories. Yeah, and, and that's one of the families that came to New York and reached out to nine eleven families, led many of us away from anger and thoughts of you know wanting revenge and wanting to vote Bush in twice than a third term if you could. You know, some 9-11 family members wanted to see nuclear weapons in Iraq, and I don't know why Iraq, but and Afghan, why anywhere? But, uh, yeah. you know, people said, I want to see mushroom clouds over Afghanistan. and uh, No, you don't. And yeah. it was the outreach. There was a family room. There was a donation made by one of the corporations in uh, New York City at One Liberty Plaza, and they had donated these two large rooms, much of a floor, as a place where 9-11 family members could sit in comfortable furniture and overlook uh, where the ruins were. And, again, all these thousands of paper cranes were arriving there. And people had asked me about the the paper cranes, and... Interestingly, it was my children who knew about Sadako. And Mm -hmm. she was a young girl in the bad part where the radiation, the fallout, the black rain, it went right toward them. And she was two years old at the time of the bomb. Her brother Masahiro, who is still alive, and in fact, he is one of only two children I know who were exposed to uh, Hiroshima or Nagasaki, who is alive today and has not developed cancer. Just let me divert for a moment. When the Titanic was discovered and I ended up getting involved with the Titanic, I found that the people who survived, you know, of course, most of the survivors were young children. We were talking 1985, 1986, Those who were still alive and could contribute details were children under the age of 14, most of them. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it's an inverted pyramid. Most of those who are within the last 10 years that you could talk to were 14 years, 13 years, 14 years or older. They had already, their bodies had mostly done their growing. Very few children. If you have radiation exposure as a child and you have all these dislocations in your DNA and you have something that's going to lead to, for example, cancer, it's going to multiply rapidly. It's going to be a ripple effect that resounds through the whole body and you die young. You, they tend most of the children died before the age of 60. And so it was horrifying after the Titanic survivors and uh, exploring the Titanic, then doing, going to Hiroshima and finding it's the opposite. 
many of the survivors were 14, 15, 20 years old, in fact, a majority of them, and mm-hmm. where there were few children. And in the case of Sadako, 10 years after Hiroshima, she was really becoming an award-winning uh, runner on the track team, bringing her school up from last place. Her teacher thought of her as an Olympic hopeful, and she started to become ill. She was she came down with leukemia, and she started folding these paper cranes one day uh, because her father told her. Now, there was a whole ward in the hospital in Hiroshima that was children with leukemia, and uh, they were all atomic bomb-exposed children with leukemia. And she's almost 12 years old at this time, and she started folding the paper cranes because some children brought the cranes to the hospital, and she asked her father about them, and her father said, ooh, something to concentrate on instead of herself. And he told her that if you fold these paper cranes, a thousand of them, you get your wish and you get your health. And she started out folding the cranes for her health. And, of course, colored paper was kind of scarce in Hiroshima after the war, all the way into the 1950s. And she found that smaller pieces uh, from smaller paper, she could get more toward her goal. She surpassed her goal. She folded the first thousand paper cranes and then continued. But here's what happened. She found that if you had to fold them smaller, the smaller folds were the most difficult. And the cranes became progressively smaller. They started at the size of sparrows. They were down smaller than bumblebees and honeybees when she got down to finishing her first thousand. And then she continued. And to finally where she was using sewing needles to fold the cranes. By then it was no longer for her health. She told her brother, I have a plan. And she was putting this prayer of the word she and her brother had, omayari, into each one. In America, when you hear that word, think the pay-it-forward principle, random acts of human kindness, or putting the other person first, thinking of the other person first. But in some way, always thinking about the other person. Finally, those paper cranes were down smaller than grains of rice, smaller than the smallest mosquito or gnat you will ever see. Her last paper cranes, you needed a magnifying glass to see the folds. And, uh, you know, she kept at it, and she kept helping other children in the hospital wherever, whenever she could. And one of her friends, when she finally had a roommate, one of her friends uh, lived a long life and always remembered her. And, And then it... It really took off around the world after the paper crane outreach program to 9-11 families. It's in the next book, not in this one, but, uh, (laughs) you know, Fukushima happened in 2011. In Japan, they call it 311. By then, there was the Tribute Center here in New York, which was a volunteer museum and tribute center all 9-11 families and survivors and first responders. And immediately we felt this connection to Fukushima. And out of, out of you know, the outreach back to the people who helped us, out of steel that was from the World Trade Center, it was arranged for a, almost two-and-a-half-foot-tall paper crane but made out of World Trade Center steel that was brought to the people of Fukushima by 9-11 family members traveling from the Tribute Center over to Japan. And we kind of hope that the paper cranes and the message of the paper cranes continues to spread around the world because even when our politicians are acting like marching morons, and wanting yeah. to build more atomic bombs, Sadako's hope and her family's hope is that random acts of human kindness, perhaps one of these acts without anyone in the world ever knowing it, it 
Uh ripples out. And some child who might otherwise grow up to do something terrible, who's living in a terrible situation, and someone reaches out and helps that child, that child may find another path. And, you know, there's the thing about the paper cranes and the meaning of the paper cranes and paying it forward, Omayari, is it empowers even children to make a difference. And even if our governments are going in the wrong direction, I mean, empower the children to help other children and know that they can make that difference. Well, that's an incredible message. And even with – you even went into the the pilots of the planes that dropped the bombs, and it it gave me a feeling that they really didn't want to drop the bombs. Uh, some of them, I wonder about Paul Tibbetts, what his response to it is. I mean, you know, a survivor, Tanamori, in fact, uh, went to him and tried to tell him at a thing where he was giving a speech in New Mexico and using all sorts of profanity about the Japanese and dropping the bomb. Tibbetts would have cakes shaped like atomic bombs and mushroom clouds. Uh, he had a very strange reaction to all of that. And even tried to have uh, Chuck Sweeney, who dropped the bomb on Nagasaki, court-martialed because he flew over a heavily defended military target three times, risked losing the bomb to try to avoid having to drop the bomb on the secondary target, which was Nagasaki, uh, where he knew there's not... One, he, he felt it was a little dishonor to drop a bomb on a place that couldn't shoot back at him and that it was a largely civilian community. The map maker, uh, the carto- cartographer who had drawn the maps that Sweeney was studying, for some reason he put in the school for the blind, the school for the deaf, and all of these schools on the maps. And the hospitals, and that stuck with Sweeney, and he knew Nakasaki and Kokora, the primary target, like the back of his hand. But uh, Tibbetts, uh, I mean, I can never understand why when Tanamori spoke to him and he said, knowing all you know today, you didn't know about radiation effects, you didn't know about flash effects, knowing all you know today, In the 21st century, if you were told that you had to drop an atomic bomb on some city, would you be willing to face court-martial? And in front of the audience, he pushed this man aside, who was a man who was standing there with a guide dog from injuries to his eyes from the atomic bomb. And uh, and Tibbetts said, I've had enough of it. He used – I won't repeat it. Uh, as he walked away. So in some way, Tibbetts was... I mean, the thing about the atomic bomb is people were afraid that it was somehow less personal and it was the opposite. Everyone on those planes knew a very strange mathematics. If you did a 300 B-29 bomber raid over Tokyo or Osaka... You knew there were over 200 other planes dropping firebombs, and so even though you knew people were dying down there, you could kind of say, well, maybe that explosion was caused by that other plane behind me or something. Hiroshima, you knew, and Nagasaki, you knew that that came back to one plane. And in fact, in the case of Jacob Bezier, who monitored the radar triggering device on both bombs, He knew that that came back to him. They all knew that it came back to one plane, not one of almost 300 others, and that affected them. Bezier said when he looked down at Hiroshima and where it looked like if you go into shallow water at the beach in the sand and you move your feet and you see all the billowing sand, that's what the ground above Hiroshima looked like. And he loved going out on boats and everything, but he said he never could go into the water at the beach and see the waves washing around his feet again after that. Were they at all hit by any radiation, the bombs, uh, the planes? Oh, yeah, the planes were hit. Excuse me one second. 
those who had fillings in their teeth actually felt and tasted their fillings partly melting. So they weren't hit very much by gamma radiation. Uh, what they were hit by were uh, basically very heavy ions, say a chip of iron or a chip of uranium or even silicon uh, uh, from the bomb, uh, accelerated up to about you know a very high percentage of the speed of light. And... Going and going through the plane, and some of them stopping, being more easily stopped by a filling, but also burrowing very narrow pits right through you, cauterizing these little narrow pits right through your body. A path that was as long as the path through your body, but no wider than a fraction of the, the diameter of a human hair. But wherever wow. one of those relativistic ions passed through you, blood cells exploded, capillaries were burst and then cauterized at the same time, and DNA was just shattered like billiard balls. I know some of the nurses um, that survived, um, they they never talked about... about um, being a survivor of of the um, the two explosions because they they didn't want people to you know think they were radioactive or whatever and there was one in particular who who never told I, she got married she survived she got married she had three children all of which were born dead yeah yeah um, and and if you were exposed while you were in uh, the middle of a pregnancy, the results were often very horrible. I just, you know, and I, I think what was the other that I wanted to, to the, there was, you spoke of a prisoner who was in one of the mines, and, and when the bomb went off, <clears throat> there were, there were so, soldiers that, were of course, guarded them, and their uh, food rations and their water rations had been cut off, because there just wasn't anything for them, and they were basically told, you're going to work until you die. And there was a guard standing at um, the entrance to the, to, the, uh, to the mine, and he was a very sadistic one. And when the bomb yeah. went off and he saw it, he turned to one of the prisoners and gave him part of his ration and said, now we are friends. Yeah, and the guy was like, you got to be kidding. Uh, <laughs> but there was another story at another camp, and there were also Chinese prisoners outside of Nagasaki, and they were even worse off than the British and the Americans. I mean, they were, they, they were afraid when Americans came through uh, with the rations from their camp to give to the Chinese. They were afraid even of the Chinese, uh, of the Americans. And uh, most of them were so far gone, almost all of them in the Chinese prison camp, uh, that only the tiniest fraction of them could even survive being given food. Uh, the <clears throat> and uh, at one camp, there were two survivors of the hell ships, one man who had actually survived the camp that Pierre Boyle wrote about, the bridge on the River Kwai, and... Uh, so these two men ended up in this one camp, and they were sabotaging the mining equipment so that uh, the workers down below were so near starvation and so ill that if the equipment wasn't working, they wouldn't be working, and they may recover some of their energy. And what one of them didn't really realize until after the war, he knew that there was this one guard who was sneaking food into the camp for them. He didn't know that the guard knew he was sabotaging the equipment. Uh, but the guard did know this. And uh, this one guard and his wife actually saved about 300 men and uh, then helped with, you know, he's, well, yeah, they actually... Two of these men actually became friends 
and remained lifelong friends after the war. And uh, the guard afterward, he said, why did you do this? Because he learned later that this man and his wife, they were risking their whole family being exterminated by the military if it was ever found out that they were sneaking food into the camp. And after the war, when he visited the man's house, he realized what meager rations they were able to bring into the camp were at great hardship to the entire family. And and the guard also, he had allowed uh, this one man and these two men to be sabotaging the equipment so that, and there was no way of missing it. When he first went to the equipment repair shed, maybe 5% of the shed floor was built with drill bits and pumps and things, was covered with that stuff that had to be fixed. By the time the war ended, that broken equipment was all the way outside the shed. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but uh, the guard who protected them knew that if the men aren't having to work to death, they won't die, even if they are, most of them are near starvation. So, uh, and he asked him, he said, why did you do this? And he said, I'm Buddhist. And uh, uh. Buddhism was uh, evidently mostly forbidden in uh, that part of Japan at that time by the local military. And he said it's with his Buddhist tradition and spiritualism that his family had to try to help them. Well, I was so so very impressed that that the survivors from the the two bombs um, that were still alive helped to um, to counsel the survivors and the families from nine eleven. And yeah, and they helped it, me tremendously. In 2010, I was having a pretty hard time. There were, so, you know, the media didn't know about spoofing yet. In fact, no one really knew about it. And so there were people contacting the New York Times and my publisher and robo phone calls, robo emails, 15,000 of them, every one of them fake, pretending to be mostly members of our military mostly members of the 509th, you know, that bomber wing still exists, the same bomber wing that dropped the atomic bombs, and pretending to be uh, these people, even a Los Alamos nuclear physicist who never existed, and when I really had enough of it was when someone contacted my publisher in the New York Times, pretending to be Richard Garwin, sending emails from Fermin Lab, and I said, look, you know, if you don't realize this is a hoax now, get on the phone, call Fermin Lab. I know the guy. He's the guy who invited me to Fermi Lab to give a lecture about the excavations on the island of Fear. <laughs> uh, but they, uh, so I, I was dealing with, my book was temporarily pulled it, didn't you? The book wasn't even available for about five years. Uh, eventually, people at Cornell University got it back out there. But in 2010, when it was first happening, uh, Sadako's brother was one of the people to immediately reach out to me. And Nakazawa, the artist I mentioned, uh, who was bending down when the bomb exploded. Now, before 2010, he wouldn't speak to me. He didn't believe that an American was going to write a book on this subject and not include chapters justifying the use of atomic bombs. And then after he saw that that was precisely the reason that I was in trouble was because I would not enter into that argument and would not justify the use of atomic bombs. And that's why people were angry and uh, people... Uh, so Nakazawa was one of the people who reached out to me, especially as one of the letters quoted from him against me was another spoofer. So at uh. the time, he was supposed to be sending a perfectly, he didn't speak English, but an email in perfect English to the New York Times and the Washington Post and to all publisher. Uh, <clears throat> And even I believed at first that it was a letter from him or a family member writing for him very angry at me. And he was a guy whose work I had admired for a long time. 
And I actually immediately wrote to a, a mutual friend a letter of apology to him. And about two weeks later, I heard back from her saying, he's very perplexed about your letter. He never wrote a letter to anyone. In fact, he was under chemotherapy at the time and under an induced coma. And then oh invited gosh. me to meet him when I was invited to Japan for the 70th anniversary of the atomic bomb, a uh, 65th anniversary of the atomic bombings. And we became pretty good friends. And he was now, also very many, interested in my interest in the, uh, the one thing that happened out of all that is so many more people came forward with stories. I'll never be finished. <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of people who had intended to take their stories to the grave, who would have been lost to history, as a result of angry people making up hoaxes and calling me un-American and stuff, they came forth telling their stories for the first time, including Kenshi Hirata. And the first edition ah. of the book, we didn't know any of his story beyond 1955 when he went into hiding. When in actuality, his wife's family helped him to remain hidden under in plain sight. Uh, living only down the block from where uh, Sesiko's uh, shrine was built by him and by her family, which he visited every day, offering pouring water over the shrine. And in 2010, in August, when I was invited to pour water over Sesiko's stone, I'll tell you, that was one of the most moving moments in my life. Wow. How many but, people? Uh, he came forward, and he, his daughter did not even know who he really was. So his daughter, working for NBC, heard that Mr. Yamaguchi had passed away in January of 2010 and was amazed to know that a man who had survived both atomic bombings lived so near to where she lived she did not know that she had grown up with a father, you know, with someone who was my, the man who raised her had also survived both atomic bombings. And uh, at first he said he really didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to talk about Sesiko. Uh, he just wanted to know the people to know that he was, he really existed because people were saying his story was made up. He didn't exist. Um, we had photos from the Mitsubishi factory, and he, you know, facial recognition and everything. It was absolutely confirmed that this was the same Kenshi Hirata. And then after a couple of months, he decided to tell his story. And, well, I'm so uh, glad he did. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> now how and then many to make people, a statement. I mean, is this, how many people... Is there any count, is there any estimation of how many people passed from these two bombs? Uh, it's hard to get a clear count, but combining both cities and radiation effects that we know of, the number will be somewhere, we don't know where, but somewhere north of a quarter million people. Wow. Well, I, I I truly hope that 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 many people pick up the book, read it, learn about how destructive it is, and and above and beyond that, um, what is to me so heart wrenching and so so amazing is the fact that the survivors really want there to be love and and um they don't want the anything like that bomb to ever fall again and and you know if you don't have the bomb then you don't have the war and and it's 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 it, they all seem to to be of the same mind they don't want vengeance they don't want revenge they want love they want they want people to learn to live together and and um have compassion for one another it's I, I think that was the one of the most it was also their, It was also why uh, their outreach, and it was why uh, 
President Obama called for on the anniversary of 9-11 for it to be a day of service to others. Uh And among Hiroshima and Nagasaki families that are, and among 9-11 families, the three grand zeros, uh, it's something we pick up, and with me, the kids, everyone in my immediate family, that it's not just one day. We live that and try our best to live that every day. Well, it's, it's, and I'm proud that you know, my, it's, what I'm proudest of that with my kids is that they uh, they had they do live that they did go in that direction, and I think to a very large degree that's because of the outreach because I was one of the people who was thinking more along lines of revenge when mm-hmm. after nine eleven, and especially if you were working in the ruins and all the personal items of people that you came across and everything, you couldn't, you know, a normal human being is going to get very angry. Yes. And revenge becomes a thing you think of. And the outreach program led a lot of us away from that. Well, gratefully. And and it's important um, to me, at least to me, it became very important. Well, and you know, when you get right down to it, it's this book does show you what happens when when you unleash something like this on humanity. And what is amazing is the humanity that those that survived it turned around and show it towards towards everyone else. I mean, it's there was I, I'm sure there was anger, but but at the same time it turned to love and understanding and compassion and commitment to making the world a better place. And, and, and I, the book think, I think this might also be part of a kind of survival filter because people I know who live to very old age, who survived the Titanic, who survived the concentration camps, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those who lived, and some of them through impossible conditions, I mean with impossible uh-huh. injuries, uh, they all became that sort of person. So maybe a lot of the people who didn't make it to later years, we're not seeing and hearing from them. Uh, mostly, I, I mean, some of the kindest people that I've known, including my own mother, were survivors of absolute horrors. And... Uh, you know, in my own family case, I assume that people who had been through horrors like my mother were uh, had been through as a child uh, all grew up to be these good, caring people out there helping others. Uh, in fact, on my parents' gravestone, it says, help hurt no one, helped many. Very few people wow. can say that about. Uh, it's, have, uh, I, I, Charlie, I, those I, who, we have talked... Okay. I think the bravest people I've ever known have survived horrible things and become these people who help other people. Uh, that That's think, what I'm yeah. saying. Okay. They become ambassadors of love and grace and compassion, which is really amazing. Um, I want to thank you so much. We're, we're right down to the last seconds. Thank you so very much. Okay. And, thank you. Um, I will be in touch with you, and hopefully we'll get some of your other books out here too. So, Thank you again, and and good night. And um, I want to thank everybody for listening. Um, realize I'm cutting it close here, but but uh, please get this book, read this book, learn what what horrors we've unleashed on 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 people, and and kind of focus on finding another way to get to to resolve issues other than something as horrific as this. Good night, everybody.